Os Nebraska Games? <risos> This, of course, is a conference in honor of Jean Fautzois. So uh, last night we recounted stories about him. I would just like to say, um, if I'd like to summarize my own feelings about him in two sentences, I would say an amazing mind, a free spirit, a true original. And I feel myself fortunate to have been his friend. This paper tries to connect two topics that have been discussed already several times, stochastic games and the Shapley value. Uh, I think the most difficult thing for me in this presentation is not to get confused between two notions that are both called the value. One is the Shapley value, the other is the minmax value. Both of them play a role here. I'll probably slip up, so I'm, I'm going to say this in advance. I will repeat the definition that already has been given before of the uh, traditional Shapley value for games, uh, coalitional games, games in char characteristic function form, uh, where the each coalition has uh, a, va uh, a worth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, which, of course, represents the amount that the players of this coalition could get on their own. So uh, the, the, the game itself is a mapping from all coalitions to uh, an allocation among the players. Since there are two to the n coalitions, it's a mapping from two to the n um, to, uh, to Rn. Now, Shapley imposed four famous conditions. The most important one is linearity. And as, as Bob Bauman pointed out, those conditions lead to a, uh, an, a sort of a formula for the Shapley value, but we should not view this as the definition. It's the result of uh, a beautiful uniqueness theorem that shows under those four conditions there is only one uh, function that satisfies them. And this is what has become the standard no notation. It's the expectation over all orders of which there are n factorial. And each, each individual i in each order receives their marginal contribution to that order. So it's, the, it's what the coalition can get. The coalition of the members who appeared before i in that order plus i can get minus what they could get without that person. Now there's uh, an extension of the Shapley value to games that um, uh, where the utility is not transferable, and that's the. Oops. Which way does it go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, where utilities are not transferable. So this is the word NTU. And uh, so that generalization can live on its own. So if you replace the, the, the V of S, instead of it being a number, it, it's a subset of the, of the Euclidean space with S coordinates, then uh, the Shapley value can be extended to uh, those, those games. But so if we had more time, and uh, traditionally, or you know, if this were an audience that was less familiar, we would need to do two steps. One is to extend the definition of the Shapley value to games where the V of S is a set rather than a number, and then take another step. The other step is to now define the Shapley value on a non-cooperative game, a strategic game, a matrix game, if you will. And so you need another step where you take the matrix game translate it to a standard game, V of S, so you have to say what that is, and then apply the Shapley value, the, the Shapley value, the NTU value to that. So it's, it's, it's a lot of steps. Luckily, they can be summarized 
in, in, uh, in a short manner. And I think the, the summary that I have here is called, is due to Amon. And uh, he's given it the name Harsani, Shapley, Nash, NTU value because all those three people had a role in the development. So the setup now is of a non-cooperative game, a matrix game, where there are n players. Each player has a finite set of, of pure strategies. Uh, a superscript S represents the strategies available to all the members of S. And GI is the payoff function that, of course, depends on the choice of all the n players. It's a mapping from the choice of all n players to a number that represents player I's payoff. G is the vector that stands a, a short notation for the payoff of all n players. And now, here is the step that is not standard in the analysis of non-cooperative games, which, that we look at the simplex that's built of all the um, pure strategies that are available to, to the players in the coalition. So we take the mixture of, so for example, if player one and two, they can choose this corner or that corner in the matrix and take a half a half of each one of them. Right? So it's correlated strategies where, of, uh, where the players of, in S mix the pure strategies that are available to them jointly. <coughs> And here is the um, Allman definition of the Harsani Shapley Nash um, NTU value. So <clears throat> the the idea is that we are going to split up what's available if all the players coordinated their actions. So what will, is going to be available is um, the. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm not used to this. What's going to be available is the convex hull of the payoffs when all, all the strategy, all the players, all the N players coordinate together. A is shorthand for A to the power N. N is the, all the players. So this is what all the players can achieve together. And just like in the ordinary Shapley value, the, the idea is to try to split this up in a way that represents what each subset can get on its own. The way to, um, to see what each sub subset could get on its own is to imagine a tug of war between, so I want to figure out what coalition S can get, I imagine a tug of war between S and its complement. And they're fighting it, it out. If you for a moment ignore these lambdas, so what's being said here I take the min-max value of a zero-sum game in which the, all the players in S add up what they can get, and we subtract what all the players not in S can get. In other words, when, the, when a choice is made of a strategy by the members of S, and there's an opposing choice by the, strat by the players not in S, that determines a payoff and I'm going to add up the payoff to all the members of S, subtract the payoff all the members not in S. So in some sense, it's if S and, and N minus S are going to fight it out, this is going to be the payoff. So still ignoring the lambdas here, uh, <clears throat> this game is a zero-sum game, and so it has a value. And remember, the, uh, the strategy sets of S and N minus S are the coordinated actions that they can take together. So S can decide on a particular mixture of <coughs> the S tuples available to them. N minus S can, can do that. These are denoted by X to the power S, X to the power N minus S. These are the mixed uh, coordinate, correlated strategy available to S, the mixed correlated strategies available to N minus S. So it's going to determine some kind of a, of a number that will show, reflect the power relationship or how much S can get on its own. And obviously by uh, the complement, what N minus S will get on its own. And then the idea would be to take these numbers as the definition of a new game, 
a game now with a, an ordinary game with v of s is, is now a number, which would be that min-max value. Define, look at what the Shapley value of that is, and thereby we will have defined the notion of dividing everything that's available to the players themselves in a... Yes? I understand that you have to subtract it in order to get the zero sum game, but is there any meaning to this? Yes, and, and that's, that's where Nash and Hersani play the role. So roughly, um, what... It's a, it's a little variable. Yeah, yeah, where did you put this? Thank you. So imagine that this is what's available to S, this is what's available to N minus S, and then this is what's available to them in total. Now we're thinking about the Nash bargaining procedure. So we're looking at a zero-sum case where the two fight it out over this line. Okay. And then the idea would be that if the min-max is here, then we will split and, and arrive at that point. So okay. maybe, it's, maybe it's worthwhile to point out at this point that as you, you make the move from here to here, what you're adding is the same number to v of s and v of n minus s, and the Shapley value doesn't change. So if you, ch if you add the same number to a coalition and to its, its complement, uh, nothing changes. Merrily, I see you want to say something? Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, so, And now this, this program would work very well, so we would have the, the, the battle between S and minus S, for, which will define V of S. We would define the Shapley value on the resultant game, and we'll say that's the Shapley value of the strategic matrix game. The trouble is that if we just did that, there's nothing that guarantees that the allocation, that the distribution of that is mandated by the Shapley value is going to be feasible, that it's going to be possible to actually implement this. In other words, the Shapley value is going to be some calculation based on the V of S. What's available to the whole coalition to, of all the players is what they can get by coordinating their actions. There's no reason why the, the one should reside in the other. But the beautiful trick here is that because we're trying to do NTU, there's nothing that prevents us from changing the scale. And so the, the theorem of Shapley is um, that if we change the scale and we don't measure the utilities in the scale originally given, but we add uh, a weight on the player's utilities, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3, so, if you will, we take the set of what's feasible and we stretch it out in one dimension, or we stretch it out in a couple of dimensions that decrease in another, then if you, if you choose those lambdas appropriately, there's obviously a fixed point argument in the background, then everything works out. So, in other words, if the min-max, if the min-max zero-sum game is not just simply adding the the utilities, but first weighting them and then adding, and taking the difference and looking at the min-max and then applying the, the ordinary Shapley values, then you get uh, that the resulting f phi sub i, phi is the Shapley operator. So the Shapley value of the game defined this way. So for each set coalition S, V lambda of S is the worth of that coalition. Phi sub i of V lambda is the Shapley value of person i in this particular game. And it's going to be feasible 
um, <clears throat> um, uh, right. So the um, the 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 psi i is going to be feasible not in the original sense, but after multiplication by the change of coordinate, by 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 the change of scaling. And oh. so for each for each c there there is lambda that does it. Okay. Yes. Psi no. is if you if there exists exists lambda all these conditions. If psi is visible okay. okay. and there are lambda such that shall yeah. be so yes. Say it again. Oh no, no. Um, the the lam there was a big discussion uh, about uh, about this point, and uh, uh, I believe that the resolution is we have to require them all to be non-zero. Is that correct? No, just the total has to be. Bob had I think a big argument over that with Al Roth. If all the lambda i's have to be uh, positive, or no, just one of them, no. just one of them. Some of them can be zero. Some of them. Yeah. If you don't allow zero, you have to have a point Yeah. You have to have a compact set. Right. So you have to allow zero, but yeah, but, yeah, but it, it makes right. Sense. But, only, okay, but the but this. Okay. Don't yes, but no, this. That's right. Okay. Otherwise, the fixed point argument doesn't work. What if and lo and behold, the fixed point argument doesn't work. It's not true. Okay. Exactly. That's okay. 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 So, now I wrote it in in a strange way a little bit here, and the reason is that I want to repeat this two more times. So, if all I wanted to do was just to define the NTU value, there'd be a simpler way of writing that. I could just say. Take the min-max value of the of this game, and uh, I wouldn't have to say exists exists three times. But I, I want to make clear that the definition of the NT, NTU value requires. Yes. Say it again. What do you require on the strategic game? Nothing. It's a finite game. No, finite yes. game. Next slide will be that exist. Yeah. Go to next slide. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I just wanted to to emphasize that there are for, for yeah. No, you won't know the conditions. OK, so this is Shapley's theorem from 1969. OK, now we go to stochastic games. So this has been, uh, stochastic games have been mentioned several times already, but uh, I will repeat. Um, so there's a set of players. There are states. So in this setup, then everything is finite. The number of state players is finite. There's finitely many states. Uh, in player i's, player i has some actions available uh, in each state. So, so if you want to be precise, the ai should be indexed by z because the actions could, the menu of actions could be different depending on the state. But um, to make the notation not so complex, we can uh, <clears throat> uh, we will ignore that. We'll assume it's the same menu of actions in all states. We will also assume that the initial state is spe specified. This will save just one index from, uh, from notations that already have a lot of indices. And obviously, any analysis that you can do when the initial state is fixed, you can also do when the initial state is not fixed by just thinking of a, of a first move where, where the initial state is chosen. And here, uh, in again, a superscript S is the set of strategies available to player i. And now the payoff at, at every stage of the game depends on the, the state in that, 
in that stage at that time, the payoff at every time, depends on the state of the system at that time and the strategies chosen by every player. And so this is a mapping from Z cross A to the N to R. And um, the last element of the stochastic game is the transition probabilities. So from at every position at every time, depending on the state of the system at that moment, the action taken by the players, there's a transition probability that's a distribution over the state the next time. So stochastic game uh, is, is an incredibly natural idea because uh, what it, it just captures the tension between doing what's best in the short run and, and the effect for the long run. You might, the, the, the payoff you can get by choosing some actions now may be very high, but it will lead to transition to a state that's not favorable. And so you have to weigh those two things against each other. And uh, Yair just mentioned to me two minutes ago that it, it, it's actually curious that so much work has been done on repeated game and much games and much less on stochastic games that in some sense are a more natural setup for economic problems, right? Because there's so much in economics has that flavor, certainly in economic competition. Yes? Yeah. Okay, so this is a small plug for, for this. It's going to be changing its state. The more um, general you get, okay. no, the, the, the less you can. Hmm? You, the more general you get, a, a, a repeated game is a special case. Okay. Yes. Okay. Never mind. Let's see. So. In a repeated game, you can hope for for uh, more specific results because you're saying more. In a stochastic game, it's uh, more general assumptions with fit more situations. But probably you can conclude less. Yeah. Right, but as you said, it fits more situations. So it's easier to think of economic modeling using stochastic games than repeated games. The okay, okay. <laughs> I won't argue with you. Uh, so the, the strategy at time t for player i is the player is to look at all the history. So the history consists of the, the states and the actions that have been taken in the previous t minus one uh, moments. And he sees the current state and must decide what to do. So a, a mixed, um, mixed strategy, a mixture over the available strategy. And so a list of those where it indicates what to do at each moment uh, t uh, <coughs> defines player i's behavioral strategies in, in the infinite game. And similarly, if you do that for each player, you get the strategy for all the players. Once you've done that, then along with the initial state, you've described the, the way the game is going to develop probabilistically. You start, you know the strategy is going to be chosen, you know the distribution over the, the next uh, state, the strategy is chosen there, and so on. So you have a distribution of, over all of these. Now, in order to get the valuation of these, as was discussed in previous talks, you have to do something with the infinite game. The simplest thing to do is to do a discounted present value of, of the stream of payoffs, so R here, is uh, the discount rate or really the interest rate and and we take the expected value <coughs> according to this R given all the strategies of all the players this determines an expected payoff to player I and the R is a reminder that the, this is the game where the valuation is according to a discount rate R and Shapley who figures here prominently of course uh, back in 53, proved a theorem that said that every zero-sum R discounted game has a min-max value and, and has uh, optimal strategies for both players, and these optimal strategies can be chosen to be stationary. Stationary, that is, basically the player does the same thing every time that, that he's confronted with the same situation. So the stationary strategy is simply ignoring the history, just looking at the state, 
and doing the same thing given the state. Now, because the NTU value was an idea that required in the battle between S and N minus S to define a min-max value. Once you have a min-max min value for, for the zero-sum R-discounted game, you can basically repeat the same development, now not for a single game, but for a stochastic game. And so <clears throat> we... Uh, Wait, I'm going the wrong way. Oh, okay. So here's the, the 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 way to proceed. We we look at the again at the correlated mixed strategies. Now we want to think about s playing zero sum against n minus s. So in this exact analogy to what was done before, we looked at correlated mixed strategies of the players in some coalition S, and we look at all the strategies in the infinite game where that coalition looks at the past, current state, and decides on the correlated mixed strategy in this state. And if you do that over every period of time T, you've defined the strategy in the infinite game, and sigma, uh, capital sigma superscript S is the set of all these strategies in the infinite game. And now, here are the same four bullet points, the same definition of the NTU value, but now for the stochastic game. So the first thing we wanted is that, so now we define a notion of NTU value, psi, but now I have to index it by, by R, by the discount rate, and <clears throat> for it to be feasible, it means that it's in the convex hull of the expected payoffs that can be done when the, the players coordinate their actions, all the players, co so this is what's feasible to the coalition as a whole. Again, we look at weights on the players. Again, we look at the min-max game, it's the zero-sum game played between S and N minus S. We add up the payoffs for the members of S. We subtract the payoff for the members not in S. Weighting payoffs by, by, the, by the weights lambda. And we look, and then we apply the Shapley value to that. And we look for, for uh, weights lambda where the resulting Shapley value gives an outcome that is feasible. And the exact same pro proof works. The reason it works is Shapley's theorem, that this min-max value exists. And so, <clears throat> so we have as a conclusion that for every fixed R, if we looked at the R discounted stochastic gain, we can define an NTU value in, in analogy with the way it was done for a single uh, matrix game. But now, as, um, as w again was mentioned before, to study the R-discounted game by itself uh, is nice and interesting, but is not that satisfying because this, the optimal strategies, as, as I believe Bob Alman mentioned in his first talk, <clears throat> when you have a fixed discount rate, just like if you have a fixed horizon, what you have to do on day one depends crucially on that interest rate or on the length of the game because you have to do a calculation that depends on this. And so if you know that the game is going to be very long or that the discount rate is small, very small, doesn't really matter much, you can't assume that the discount rate is zero because then nothing would converge just like you can't assume that the length of the game is just assume that it's infinity, but you want to say that you still know what to do on day one if all you know is that the discount rate is small, but not exactly how small. So you, need, you want to do a, 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 a transition from the definition of the NTU value for a fixed R to something that's uniform over all small R. 
And in order to do that, we use a, a technique that is traditional in stochastic games. Uh, and, and the first step is to observe that the statement, the four statement of, with the four parts, this exists, that exists, so that, so and so, is um, so the statement for oh. traditional means uh, used by, uh, by the speaker. <laughs> okay. Traditionally means. Uh, was that so the statement for every interest R, there exists a psi sub R in Rn, that psi sub R is a is a sharply value of, of the game with interest rate R, is a statement that has four parts, and it's what's called an elementary sentence. So an, an, an elementary sentence is you start with polynomial, a polynomial with uh, integer coefficients, and you write p equals zero or p greater than zero. So that's the building blocks. Now you take these building blocks and you put them together with quantifiers of the type and or uh, not, and that builds a, a more complex formula. And then you use the quantifiers for all or there exists for the, for the variables themselves. So if you build something like this in finitely many state, uh, finitely many steps, you get an elementary formula, and this elementary formula is called an elementary sentence if all the variables are quantified. The reason that makes a difference is if all the variables are quantified, then the statement is either true or it's not true. But if the not if some variables are not quantified, then that's not the case. So, for example, let's say you write something like um, there there exists y such that uh, y y squared is x. Okay. So, okay. so this is an elementary formula, but it's not a sentence because it's true for some x and may not true for others. But if you write for all x greater than zero, then this is a, a sentence. Right? It's either true or it's not true. Um, OK. Here are just two quick notes to say, if you, if you look at those four statements, you may wonder, because some of them have infinite animals in them, and you may wonder, why is that an elementary sentence? But if you think about it a little bit, you realize that, uh, that it works. So the two steps I don't have time to, to uh, explain in more detail. So the convex hull of what can be achieved by strategies in that infinite game looks like it might be a complicated set. But in fact, from Shapley's proof, you can see that everything that's in the convex hull can actually be generated by pure stationary strategies, of which there are finitely many. So it's going to be a simple polytope. Are you talking about two personal? Say it again. It's two personal what? So the value. For the, the value, this is Shapley value is the two person. So the two person. So there's a statement there that for every s and s, n minus s, there's a value, right? Oh, I'm sorry. This here, here it's actually a single person, uh, the, the convex hull. Thank you. The convex hull, uh, the reason that that's a simple set is even simpler because it's a one person. No, no, that's not my question. Okay. You're talking about n person, this convex stochastic game, or what is it? N person, n yes. Okay. N person, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is an elementary sentence. And now there's a famous principle called Tarski's principle for real closed fields that says that <clears throat> if an elementary sentence is true in one real closed field, it's true in any other real closed field. I'll skip the definition of real closed field, but all we need to know for this is that uh, the real number is a real closed field. And another real closed field is, is, is the field of these expressions which are uh, uh, power series in fractional, in, uh, fractional powers of, of R. M is a fixed integer. 
that converge when R is sufficiently small. So these are also called uh, real Puiseux series. And so from the existence theorem of Shapley, it, it follows that the same existence theorem is true for this field. And so it, the, the three quantities that come out of those four conditions, the psi sub r, which is the Shapley allocation, the lambda r, which are the weights, and the v sub r, which is the, the, the worth of each coalition s, all these things have an expression in, in these terms, and therefore they converge as r goes to zero. Okay, so these limits exist. Um, okay, now the, the main result in, this, in the theory of, of two-person zero-sum stochastic games is the existence of the uniform value to which I alluded to before, which is a, a value, uh, okay, so this is a handful if you haven't seen it, be, a mouthful if you haven't seen it before, but basically it says that for every epsilon, there are epsilon optimal strategies for all player, for both players that work up to an epsilon regardless of the, of the interest rate if it's low enough. So that's exactly what we want. Uh, that, that is the step beyond just the solving a, a, a single game. And then we write exactly the same conditions that we had for the NTU value that we've seen already twice. So we repeated it for the third time. Instead of a fixed R, we now write those four conditions. But this time, we're, we are imposing the, the min-max not on the, uh, we're not saying, not taking the definition of the min-max for a fixed R, but we're taking the definition of Neyman, Mertens and Neyman, oh, of course, I forgot the main thing, which is here we have the red, and right, this is a, a, a great contribution of uh, Mertens and Neyman. So, um, so now we can do, since their theorem has, th their theorem does the work. So in other words, it shows that you can define the min-max value not just for a fixed R, but uniformly for all R or for all large N, if you will. You can look at the, at the conditions and basically repeat them. And you say, let's look at this at the zero-sum game between S and N minus S, but now I demand of the min-max value that it be the uniform value in the sense of Mertens and Neyman, and everything else remains the same, and then subject to a few, <clears throat> um, uh, to a few technical things, uh, the, the, the final conclusion is that basically you can repeat everything the same way as before and conclude that in every stoch stochastic game you can define the uniform NTU value, the uniform uh, Arsani, Nash, Shapley value. Uh, since I have a couple of minutes, I will just um, mention, for, for example, this one. Um, what... what um, um, in, f f forget the rest of it now. If you have a, a stochastic game, and you look at the at the min ma a two-person stochastic game, and you look at the min-max of that game with discount rate with interest rate r, and that converges as r goes to zero by the Tarski theorem. Because the Neyman, um, the Mertens Neyman min-max solution is in particular, right, if you have something that's epsilon optimal for all R um, that are small enough, it's going to be in particular the limit of the min-max values in the optimal strategies in the game indexed by R as R goes to zero. So by the fact that, let me go back, Because these things converge, and because the Neyman, Mertens Neyman strategies exist, we know that the convergence is to 
those strategies. So therefore, we know that the, that the limit of this process is the uniform min-max value. Um, Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> so uh, since since I have a minute, I just want to mention why some things that might be, might be look complicated, in fact, are not. Um, wait a minute. And this is. Uh, I don't. I can't find the. This okay. So some things that may look complicated, in fact, are not. And so I mentioned already this one here. So what what's going on here is you are asking yourself what can all the players achieve when they uh, coordinate their actions together in the infinite game. But Shapley has shown that uh, right in, in a stochastic game there's a stationary optimal strategy. This game where all the players coordinate is in fact a one-person stochastic game. So in a one-person stochastic game if you have a stationary optimal strategy you might as well st choose the strategy to be a pure strategy because at every stage you simply have to choose between a finite number of choices and therefore this convex hull is, is, is a very simple set. It's, uh, it's quantum. Similarly, the statement that there exists a value for the stochastic game played between S and N minus S with weights lambda when it's over infinite streams discounted by R, again, might look like it's, not, it's nothing elementary. It's not something that's built up in a finite number of steps from polynomials. But Shapley's proof, in fact, is, shows that if you, that the, the value of the game as well as the optimal strategies can be recovered from a very simple recursion equation that I think also was mentioned before. And the recursion equation is this. So now just forget all the rest of it. You have just a single stochastic game and you want to, to understand what Shapley has done. So what Shapley does is he says, let's take at, at the current payoff, G that depends on the state and the actions, and see where, what the future payoff is going to be, assuming that we already know what we're going to get when we reach the next state. So if V is the value of the game, if V is the correct value of the game, then this represents what the player should, should uh, evaluate, how the player should evaluate the position that's reached when the state is z and the action is a it comprises of awaiting by a factor of r of the current payoff and one minus r of the future payoff that is the average of all the v's in the state that you will get to now if if we'd have the correct v then there should be a fixed point here in other words that the that the so g z v is just a notation for this game that if i uh, calculated the value of this game, I will get back the V. And so what it, it means that the value as well as the optimal strategy of this infinite stochastic game with weighting R is in fact a solution of an equation inv involving a game which is just one state, one stage, a one-time game, but where the, the entries of the payoffs are these expressions. And so because it's a solution of a simple equation e involving uh, finitely many strategies on both sides of the equation, it is an, an elementary statement. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Uh, just a second. Where is? I'll tell you where is. <coughs> You, you devoted the last few minutes of your talk to um, 
uh, setting forth this uh, functional equation for the min-max value. Huh? Yes. You started your talk by saying that there's going to be a confusion between the min-max value and the Shapley value. So now, since you ended the talk with setting forth the functional equation for the min-max value, let me ask you whether there might not be a similar functional equation for the Shapley value of the stochastic A. Okay, the Shapley value that you just defined. The NTU value. In, in other words, you say, why rely on the fixed point argument inside the, the fourth condition, so on, but just do a... So uh, you might, uh, there might be difficulties because yeah. the the lambdas are going to be perhaps different for the different states, yeah? Yes. And it, this could screw up, but maybe a slightly different definition, or maybe it won't screw up, or what, I don't know. Yes, one thing, just, just to, be, uh, to build up on what you say, one thing I, I forgot to mention is that the, sharp, the NTU value is not unique, and neither are the lambdas unique. So one of the tricks here with Tarski is that it selects not only the Shapley values but the lambdas in a way that they both move together to a limit. Now if you wanted to do a single fixed point argument you would have to do something that you know achieves that but perhaps in one step. So yes what what huh? what is your interpretation of the Shapley value of stochastic game? Of stochastic uh, game? Yeah. yeah. I mean, in a regular game, we know how to interpret. This is a beautiful uh, structure, but uh, what's the interpretation you had in mind when you do it? Don't see, I, don't see any, uh, I don't see any difficulty here beyond the interpretation of the Nash or Sani Shapley, because if you buy that concept, you buy this. There's nothing here beyond. But what's the meaning of, I mean, the Shapley value is something evaluating the power of a player or, uh, or uh, alternatively the value of participating in this game. Yes. Or interpret okay. it in so the same way when I enter I'm a saying, stochastic game or end, end person stochastic game? Any game. Any game. Any game. Any game. Any game. Any game. So you look at the stochastic game. The point is that you're going to get from 1 to 0. That's the point of the game. Yeah. What's this count? No, just... Because there are other questions. Done. Yes. Do you remember the Shapley's paper of 1968 contains reference to stochastic games? To tell you the truth, I never read that paper. No, I don't. Use, use this paper to prove something. It is doesn't refer to strategic game. It means it should prove something called strategic game. Yes. So, so, so the R. <laughs> there is really some uh, some mix up in the literature uh, of when it exists. No, no. No. The answer, no. Is, no. No. The answer <laughs> is I. The, yes, I think in '69 there is no, but there was some development, and I think at these ages, much of the developments were in either technical reports or comments or informal things. So I think probably the first one is. No, but also Alman Shapley is for the case of uh, Alman Kertz. Alman Kertz. In Alman Kertz, there is the development kind of systematic for some games with a continuum of uh, agents. Uh, but if, if one looks on the proof and makes the modification, it is straightforward. So, uh, so the same proof, the same. The same proofs works also for the existence of the NTU value in strategy games. Now it is. You don't use the condition, you use the proof. So it's essentially the same proof or an analog proof. Yes. 
Okay, so in the paper we'll have to bring a proof that is probably known to many, uh, to many, but maybe we cannot pinpoint on where it appears. Say it again. Is there any hope to to obtain an axiomatic characterization of the Shapley value for these games? Any hope? Characterization of the Shapley ah. value. Axiomatization. I think it's related to Schmel's uh, concern. Well, there's an axiomatization for uh, of the NTU value. Uh, not for strategic games. Not for strategic games. For cooperative, for cooperative games. Not for strategic games. No, oh, this is your viewing the, this strategic game as a cooperative game. game. Yeah. You're using no, no, but you want to you want to get the, the threat, the, the picture there. You want to have all these things inside, not to assume it. I mean, why? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, the the threat game that is played. The threat maximization yeah. of that so that so this go directly on the game in strategic form. Right. Because the reduction from strategic form to that goes through something, and that you want to be. Also, to well, the and and above that, uh, if you have an axiomatization for a certain domain, you narrow the domain, but you can't necessarily use the same axiom to get axiomatizations of the narrower domain. Because well, the dynamics, okay. Uh, maybe let let me make you one uh, one comment, and uh, I think this was one. Uh, you want to make a comment? Uh, so one comment is that we uh, applied here this method of the Shapley NTU value to uh, stochastic games. I think one lesson that we should understand it that it's a kind of an n-person stochastic game theory, and similarly for other repeated games that one could uh, in complete formation others. Uh, one could apply a similar analysis. The interesting point here is that in its solution, all that we need to know is the solution of the two-person zero-sum games. Even though we are analyzing a game which is n-person game, non-zero-sum, the actual existence theorems are needed only for the two-person zero-sum games. So, for at least those economists that sometimes say why the theory is only for two-person zero-sum games, the answer is that even if we look on non-zero-sum games, the two-person zero-sum games gives a solution. And then another uh, comment was uh, based on what uh, Bezalel was mentioning, what exists where and so on. So there are some work, some underground work, some unpublished work on the NTU value, and there are also many open problems there. So everybody is invited, invited to do some work there. For, in, in, for example, <laughs> does, is generically the NTU value <laughs> finite for a game in normal form? This, well, is, this is unknown. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah, it's a family.